Hello, I'm David Hunt, CEO and founder of the Hyperion Cleantech Group and your host for the Leads in Cleantech podcast. Thanks for joining us again. As you can probably see, I've been away for a couple of weeks, thus the panda eyes and the, uh, and the suntan. Um, but back with a bang with a great guest this week. I'm here with uh, Dr. Lindsay Higgins, who's a climate scientist who has found herself working with an impact VC. So lots of to unpack there. Lindsay, welcome to the podcast. Hi, David. Thanks so much for having me. It's great to have you back uh, online. We had the opportunity, of course, to meet in a, a very snowy Stockholm not too uh, not too long ago, which is where you're actually based at the moment. I'm a little bit north of Stockholm myself, um, but I, I lived in Stockholm for about 10 years, moved to Sweden to, to study at the university there. Um, and now I've, I've found myself in a bit more of a rural situation outside of the city, but working remotely with the team. Sounds idyllic. So let's talk a little bit about that. So how does a, a, a Canadian... Uh, find themselves firstly studying climate science and then obviously moving to Stockholm and, and having a career which we can touch on and then obviously finding yourself with a, an impact VC, which is not necessarily uh, an obvious route for someone who's uh, embarks on an academic background to, in, in climate science. So perhaps you can share a little bit of your journey, Lindsay, if you wouldn't mind. Absolutely. Um, not Canadian, though, but close. I'm, okay. I'm from the, the Canadian border in the US. I know you're North. York. Buffalo, Okay. <laughs> Very close to Canada. <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean, journey wise, I, uh, I'm a geographer by training, um, which means that I study sort of uh, interactions between people and their environment over space and time. And you'll find that most geographers have a sub discipline that they focus on as well. And for me, that happens to be climate change mm -hmm. um, and, and weather and climate to to more of an extent. But I've always been very curious about how changes in the climate affect, you know, the, the way people behave and live their lives. Um, and that has sort of guided my academic trajectory. Mm -hmm. So when I moved to Sweden, it was to study how uh, people in East Africa were interacting with freshwater resources in the face of, of climate change. Mm -hmm. So not just from a modern perspective, but also looking at past climates as well. So how were, um, you know... Uh, nomadic agriculturists and, and people who were uh, navigating the, the semi-arid environments interacting with, with water as a resource. Uh, but while I was studying, I, I became very frustrated that so much of the science that was happening around me seemed to just kind of die on the shelf. I mean, right. as a, a researcher, you're constantly searching for, you know, the next project, the next funding source, and the priority isn't really on on sharing that research and making sure it gets into the hands of people who can do something with it. Yeah. So I... Um, I set out to become involved with with science communication as much as I could. So for me, while I was studying, that meant you know taking any course I could I could come across in in public speaking or in in writing for a broad audience. I would volunteer at um, at events and conferences and just really anything I could do to expose myself to to communications and and how to to take these really complicated scientific subjects yeah. and make them more accessible to a broader audience. So when I finally finished my degree, uh, that was my goal, to get into the communications field, uh, to really become sort of a bridge for, for the two sides, to, to, to translating the science and, yep. and, and making it um, compelling and approachable. And yeah, I, I actually ended up taking an internship for a, a tech startup where I could trade my knowledge of geography and mapping um, for this sort of crash course in media and communications right. and, and uh, public relations because they were working on uh, computer vision generated geospatial data. It was a, a tech startup called Mapillary. Um, and yeah, so I, I worked my way up from, from the intern level, eventually found myself running communications for a fund that invests in uh, women's sexual health, which these headphones that I uh, am wearing today is a remnant of my time <laughs> with the, the case for her, that, that particular fund. Uh, but the goal was always to get back to climate. I mean, that's originally what I set out to do was yeah. to take climate science and, and, and get it into the, the hands of people who are making change happen. And I really saw that opportunity with my current organization, Pale Blue Dot, who are a, a group of venture capitalists that are investing in climate tech innovation. And they really put um, an emphasis on 
being very research kind of focused and and using the science to inform their decision making process. So when I came in, it was really to to spearhead these efforts that they had already started setting up for themselves, yeah. um, and bring the the climate expertise and also this sort of um, practical experience that I developed in the communications world together to help really push forward what they they were working on. Right. Right. Let's talk about that a little bit more then, because again, you know, I work with many clean tech VCs and obviously impact driven and, and clearly, you know, close to, to data as such. But you're the first, as far as I'm aware, that certainly I've come across specifically that has a, you know, a climate scientist on board. How, how have you found firstly working within the VC fund? And more broadly, how have you found uh, speaking at and engaging in the broader um, VC community in terms of your specific role and skills that you bring to the table? Sure. I think um, I see so much potential in the VC space. I mean, I I never set out to work in, in VC. I just saw it as um, as sort of an avenue to, to push change forward and to sort of accelerate innovation. And I think from from a science perspective um, and, and maybe even an impact perspective as well, it's it's more of a, a slow burn than if you're working with something where you see that sort of immediate change and immediate yep. impact, because especially for us, we're investing at, at such an early stage. We're coming at the, the seed stage and earlier. So it's really to um, to create the companies of, of the future. So you have to have like sort of the... I guess a, a more of a visionary approach <laughs> versus... Mm-hmm. you so. So what is the potential for change, which is, you know, what right. are they actively doing at the moment? Um, and I always tell, I, I try to work, uh, I, I like to bring other researchers and other scientists into the climate tech space. And when I'm talking about the type of work that, that you might do for a VC fund, I always try to make it clear, like you you have to have that sort of uh, patient long-term vision when you're you're working in this kind of environment. Um, but I mean, if these innovations pay off, I mean, the potential is for them to pay off hugely. Yep. So it's it's definitely, um, it's different. And it can be a little bit intimidating to have so much of, uh, like so much on the line. I mean, mm-hmm. this these are, you know, millions of dollars that you're talking about. Uh, so I'm glad that I don't have sort of a, a vote, like an official <laughs> vote when it comes to, to making investment decisions. Um, but I think... I just I see so much uh, potential and possibility in in forming these decisions and making sure that they're guided by science. Yeah. Um, so that yeah, hopefully uh, we're we're steering the ship in the right direction. <laughs> yeah. No. Absolutely. I think that's a critical thing. The last episode we did actually was with a fusion startup, First Light Fusion, which again is one uh, of those technologies where the potential impact is enormous, but clearly the timelines are, yeah. are reasonably long. Um, with, with the fund, obviously being involved at Seed and before, it is, as you say, a, a real leap of faith at that stage uh, in terms of the yeah. right entrepreneur, the, with the, the tech, often you don't yet have product market, all these kinds of things. How, how yeah. much do they rely on you to steer the areas where the fund should be looking? And how much is there a little bit more when they're approached or when they see an interesting startup, do they get you to explore a little bit of what are the potential impacts further down the line? How does that sort of dynamic work? So, well, there's two types of projects that I'm 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 working on, and and the first priority is on these sort of live deal projects where a company comes across, um, and you know the the partners think they're really interesting, but they need to understand the the potential for it for yeah. impact from a client perspective, a climate perspective. So, in that case, it's it's number one trying to understand understand the problem that this company is looking to address uh, because we invest in in a very broad sort of range of, of innovation. I mean, we're almost sort of sector agnostic as mm-hmm. long as the climate impact is there. So uh, like that, that sort of first um, responsibility is to understand the, the issue at hand. And then it's, okay, we understand the problem, but is this solution the, the right one for said problem. Yeah. And that um, can come down to, you know, are there any negative consequences that we need to be aware of? I mean, especially when we're talking about you know, anything that's that's dealing with the environment or the climate or water. I mean, there's so many downstream effects yeah. of, of changes that we make, and it's really important to understand those. So it's uh, it's not just looking at the potential benefits, but also like 
what could go wrong here? That's that's important for us to understand. Um, and those are quite short projects. I mean, on the the scale of, you know, a couple of days to maybe a couple of weeks just to really help the team decide if this is something we want to to move forward with to to pursue in yeah. in terms of making an investment. On the other side of that, which is what you were um, alluding to a bit, are these more like thematic projects mm-hmm. where I'm looking at a, a broader topic rather than a specific company. So in there, it's understanding the the scope of, of the issues at hand as well, but looking for... Um, you know, what are the potential entry points for for venture capital or, or innovation to really, you know, make an impact or have a difference? So uh, just as an example, I mean, we've looked at like forestry and biodiversity. So from from that side of things, it's you have to understand, you know, what are all of the sort of elements in play in the forestry space and different yep. approaches and, and methodologies. So it's understanding um what the startup landscape looks like. And we have a, a really amazing, uh, I have a colleague who's sort of in charge of of landscaping the the, the existing um, innovation space. But then it's, you know, what's happening in, in research? What are the, the projects that we need to be aware of um, that, you know, can can come out and potentially change things? And, and again, like, are there sort of these uh, downstream interactions that we we need to know. I mean, in in sort of the, the forestry space, I mean, there's been this long-term thinking where, you know, you cut down one tree, you plant two in its place, and that's enough. Right. But when you start to think more broadly from more of a systems perspective, okay, but are those two trees the right trees for the right location? What sort of effects are they having on water consumption and biodiversity? So there's, um, yeah, it's it's... That's just one example, but it's it looking at these broader, more systems-based approaches to to a theme. Yeah, I think it's interesting. I mean, it's a long time ago, but when I was doing my own environmental uh, you know, studies, that that the, the, the externalities, as you say, the consequences that aren't always yeah. obvious are uh, important, right? Because again, we're climate by definition is a very complex issue and sometimes as you say there's yes. these issues or or, or, or or subsets of events that could happen based on what was done with the best of intents and with the best of knowledge in some regards yeah. has then a no- negative knock-on effect and whilst most of the VCs I work with clearly are you know well informed broadly it's really interesting as you say they the, the blue dot obviously impact or, or, or they'll a little bit deeper into the potential impacts of, of their investments further down the line I think that humans as as a group, we tend to be quite short-sighted when it comes to solving problems. I mean, we we tend to go for the fastest, the cheapest, the Mm -hmm. easiest. um, And then it's, you know, later on down the line, well, maybe we shouldn't have done it that way. And we're kind of, I mean, we're at a point where we can't really afford to to make those mistakes anymore right. because every step that we take is is so critical and crucial to safeguarding our, our future on this planet. Um, I think that, I mean, like refrigerants are, are a great example. So in, in the 90s, there was, you know, the big call to ban the, the CFCs. They're putting a hole in the ozone layer. And, you know, we we acted, we got together, we we banned CFCs and we're seeing, you know, the the hole is, is healing itself. And that's amazing. But the compounds that we replace the CFCs with, it turns out, can absorb like thousands of times the the amount of heat as carbon dioxide, so now we're in a place where we need to, you know, figure out uh, the next step. Um, mm-hmm. And maybe if we'd paused and 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 looked a little deeper, we could have avoided some of those issues. Right. Uh, but yeah, it's there's there's always those trade offs, but we try to be as as well informed as possible. Jumping back on a couple of the other things you touched on, then in terms of communication and, and behaviors, of course, I think that's one of the. The challenge is one of the reasons I started this podcast is because I, I just felt that actually education, awareness, and 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 um, communication were key factors because so many people don't know what's uh-huh. possible, don't know what's happening, and don't know where and how yeah. to engage. And I, I think that's where storytelling and communication really comes into its own. But behavior is an interesting thing. We looked obviously the most recent IPCC report, which was which was frightening, uh, or, or, although predictable yes. in many regards to, to many of us who've, who've been around the block a little while, but. What do you feel from your own point of view? Some of the major challenges as to why, as humans, we don't 
stare into the abyss and, and, and make actions as we have done on occasion, clearly, as you mentioned there with, with the ozone layer. But more broadly, there's still at governmental level and the individual level, a, a, I wouldn't say necessarily a reluctance, but, an, but, but, but there's an inertia uh, that doesn't lead us to make the right decisions quickly enough. Yeah. Um, I actually, I saw a, a post that, that Hannah Ritchie from Our World in Data wrote um, just in, in the last week or so around how um, climate sort of despair is is almost as bad as, as climate denial, because mm-hmm. either way, action isn't happening, right? You get kind of frozen in this. On one side, it's climate change doesn't exist. Uh, but on the other side, it's yes, it does, but we can't do anything anyway. And, and that's not helpful. And I think that Yes, the situation is is scary, and and I think with the the latest summary for policymakers that the IPCC came out with, uh, I mean very much so. We're on this trajectory right now for over three degrees of warming, which you know is more than double the the target set by the Paris Agreement, and it's it's bleak. I mean we're we're in for a lot of uh, a lot of harsh realities, but it's not hopeless, and I think that's really the key in that. We need to inspire action. We need to inspire hope, um, but at the same time, be honest and be and be realistic. And it's it's a very fine line to walk, uh, where you know you want to avoid scaring people into inaction, mm-hmm. um, and also you know, uh, hopefully inspiring them to to act and to change their behaviors. But um, I think the. the I'd like to see more more of that sort of honest approach to to things. I I'm I get quite frustrated when I see, you know, we're going to plant a trillion trees and that's going to to solve the crisis yep. and and I think that that almost is it's a red herring, right? I mean, people think oh, they're going to solve it. They're going to plant a trillion trees and and we're fine. I can drive my SUV, you know, 2 miles to work every day and it's not a problem. Um and and we need to be realistic and honest about the fact that, you know, planting a trillion trees is not a substitute for decarbonization. It's not a substitute for climate action. We still need those elements. Those are, are what we really need to 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 work towards. Um, but yeah, yeah uh, communications is is a huge part of it. And there's a lot of research going on around sort of the psychology of how do we, you know, inspire that sort of action and and um, and prevent the the despair and and sort of uh, inaction side of things. Uh, and it's going to be of increasing importance moving forward. Yeah, definitely. I think one of the, uh, the advantages of the of the dark side, so to speak, if you look at the sort of the a lot of the fossil fuel companies playing the sort of the tobacco uh, playbook of of, of sh- just sharing enough fear, uncertainty, yes. and doubt, such that people are forced into this inertia where you just don't know what's possible, and and, and that uh, is frustrating because on the flip side of that, that that's hard to overcome in terms of from a b- behavior perspective. So. Um, as a communicator, maybe there are some thoughts from all of your experiences in terms of how we can, as a community, and how we can, a lot of the audience work with within startup uh, community. How can we better articulate our message? Uh, how can we better address some of these um, confusions that's deliberately sown in many cases to, to stop people from acting? Um, I think the sort of first step is to is talk to each other, is to work together and, and share our learnings and our knowledge. Um, I, th- it, there's, I mean, we're ultimately like, you know, this is a business base, like where the, the goal is to turn a, turn a profit. Um, but I mean, at, from a broader perspective, this is an issue that affects everyone. Yeah. So we've kind of, uh, really prioritize that, you know, open communication, that knowledge sharing, you know, getting people talking to each other and, and sharing resources, um, and I think that's a really important first step is is to not sort of silo all of our our knowledge and our our information. Yeah. Um, from from another side, it's uh, it's knowing <laughs> knowing how to deal with sort of the 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 dark sides, the the deniers, the the 
the sort of doom and gloom side of, of climate change. Um, and I think there's there's a lot to be learned from sort of those, those social science sides of, mm-hmm. you know, how to how to inspire in in your information sharing and, and how to to keep people engaged. Um, but there's there's actually a really great uh, website called Skeptical Science, which is geared towards how to identify the different types of, of denial in climate right. science. Like what are the, the tactics and approaches that they're using and then present the information in a way that appeals to sort of the, the logic and um, the 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 structure behind uh, how they're they're thinking and forming their arguments and i right. think that understanding the way sort of the the other side thinks mm-hmm. is is important as well yeah no, absolutely thanks for our, our research that and we can add it to the uh, to mm-hmm. the episode link so people can take a, a dive into it themselves one of the Great. other areas i think is is interesting going back to with touching very briefly on the ipcc report there of, of just you know, is fairly frightening out there i was speaking to a vc and i won't name them uh, here but i was speaking to a vc recently who really wanted to be open and talk about adaptation, um, but felt a little bit frightened that that was not a uh, was a bit of a Pandora's box when you start opening that. And I, I, I'll explain a little bit for, uh-huh. for, for for the thinking for why it's because we live in a very much a sort of a zero sum game society, right? Something's either fixed or it's not fixed. Like you say, you plant a million trees, you fix the problem. You switch everyone to EVs from ice cars, and it solves the problem. So, but the reality is that yes, all of those things are important and can play a part, but. It's not a zero-sum game, right? We are in a situation where a lot of the um, outcomes, that, the seeds that we've already sown are going to bear fruit at some point and not necessarily in a positive way for humanity. Uh, uh, do you find in the community there's a reluctance to talk about adaptation versus you know, solving all of the problems and getting us to a you know, zero-carbon or even a negative emissions society? I, I think that's changing slightly. I mean, from our perspective, we have sort of three core areas that we're looking into. The first is, you know, how do we reduce emissions? um, And then how do we reverse our current warming trajectory? But the third is, is preparing for a new future. Because to a certain extent, I mean, the the changes that we're going to experience over the next couple of decades are, are, are baked in. I mean, there's, there's potential to to reverse the situation. I mean, we can definitely dial it back if we decarbonize fast enough, if we, you know, make the right moves. But we also need to live with the reality that, you know, um, coastlines are are rising, like sea levels are rising. Uh, There's going to be heat waves. There's going to be extreme weather. These are things that we have to adapt to. There's kind of no no way around that. Um, and, And I think there's it's certainly on, from the IPCC's perspective, the call for adaptation solutions is much stronger in in these recent reports than we've right. seen in previous years. But a lot of that's because of sort of the the recognition and the the uh, the surety that we are heading in in that direction. So, I mean, for like in our portfolio, we have um, Climate X, which which helps banks and and corporations identify climate risks um, in terms of, you know, what sort of extreme weather events Mm -hmm. to expect or, or, you know, what's going to affect physical assets uh, in, in that respect. And, and we certainly need those. That's, that's something that um, we're going to need more investment in moving forward. So I think, yes, there has been a bit of a hesitancy, especially, uh, because there's there's just such a pull for there to be like measurable reductions in carbon for all these types of investments that you're making in the climate side, but that's not the full picture. Mm-hmm. There's a lot more to to climate and climate um, climate adaptation, climate mit- mitigation are are two you know separate but equal sides of the the story yeah. we need to to address both yeah no absolutely um perhaps you can show a little bit because we're at a stage now where it's kind of we need everything all at once to to coin the phrase yeah. but um for you personally uh where do you see the p- biggest potential uh technologies that you see or come across or represented with that can perhaps make the 
biggest impact. We touched on fusion being one, one obvious examples, but are, are there other areas either in, because uh, again, resources, water, I know is something you touched on. It's something which within the yeah. climate tech space, I don't think we talk enough about water tech and water resources, but are there areas where you're most excited that we're you're seeing s potential solutions that can make a real impact? One thing um, that's come out of the this latest wave of IPCC reports, which is incredible, is they have this figure that outlines really nicely uh, different areas for impact, and they chart those against the potential for emissions reductions, but also the um, sort of uh, cost expectancy for, for each type of innovation. So you can see, you know, what has has high potential for, for reduction in low costs like solar or wind energy, but what has high potential for emissions reduction, but high costs. And I think those um, have a lot of potential to be a real sweet spot for technology to come in and help scale the impact, to help drive down the costs and, and really uh, realize those uh, reductions potentials. So a lot of those happen to fall on the the land, water, sort of food side mm -hmm. of, of things. Um, I mean, water, I think, is going to be so essential moving forward, as you just mentioned, because we can't like we can't separate climate from water. I mean, so many of our, our mitigation options are, are land based and mm -hmm. those just aren't viable options without water security as well. So that's going to be a big important component but a lot of it is you know ensuring that we're not converting land we're not you know taking forests and wetlands and converting them over to agriculture so how can we do more with what we already have yeah. like how can we be smarter about our approaches to 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 food systems and and providing for a growing population while still you know conserving our our forests and our wetlands and the things that we need to to ensure that we can uh deal with the, the amount of carbon that we're already pumping into the atmosphere. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now those are important areas. I want to perhaps sidetrack a little bit to the area of diversity. Um, um, you know, obviously, we, we talk in our lives around diversity in terms of the technologies, diversity in terms of uh, the, the, the solutions that are potential to solve a problem. But from a societal point of view, a lot of the conversations we see are around that there's not always a load of diversity, not just in gender diversity, but diversity across you know, all aspects of society. And and we've worked hard, my organization, and I mentioned on the podcast recently, where we, we placed last year 42% of our, 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 of our leadership placements were, were women. Uh, and I'll hold my hands up and say the Q1 of this year, we haven't quite gone on, on, on track with that. It, it's it's not easy, but it's, it's, it's important. Uh. Where... Do you see uh, that topic? Do you see that that's better? Do we see more female founders coming across your table? Do we see more female-led funds? Do we see more um, diversity broadly within the conversations that you're having? And, and, and why is it still by predominantly a, a male-led uh, sector? I mean, clean tech, of course, is a, is a broad umbrella, but energy in particular is you know, still a very male-dominated environment. Do you, do you see improvements? Do you see better outcomes and a more diverse and equitable ecosystem for, for people who want to be involved in the clean tech sector? I think um, just from from what I'm seeing that on the, the climate side and the environmental side, that, uh, I mean, there are a lot of female entrepreneurs and female-led funds Um but I mean, you can also see research that shows that women just care more about the environment. So I think that's that's definitely um, part of it. But I mean, from if you dial it back and think about it from sort of a, a, a systemic level, I mean, who has the opportunity to to innovate? Um, like where are where are the founders coming from? I mean, it's it, it's people who have sort of the security to be able to to step back from from their jobs and and start a company or mm -hmm. or you know have the the sort of uh, social structure to to support themselves through through these uh, this growth. And I mean, I think that uh, what we've seen is that's definitely skewed towards you know white sort of. Uh, middle class, well to do men, and and that's kind of uh, a, a societal, like systemic issue that's at hand in um, in startups and, and entrepreneurship in general. Uh, I mean, for I think it's it's improving, but there's definitely still a lot more that can be done to you know encourage more more diverse founders. I mean, I've seen recently. Um, 
like we have unconventional ventures uh, calling out, you know, stop mentoring and start funding. I mean, women mm-hmm. get mentored and men get funded. <laughs> so we need to, you know, prioritize getting the right kind of support into the right places. Yeah. For us, we have these diversity office hours where, where funders can apply for, you know, one-on-one time directly with our, our general partners um, if they consider themselves to be, you know, in an underrepresented group. Um, and I mean, that's, we've, some of our, our portfolio companies have have come out of those engagements. So it's been, right. you know, really worthwhile for us because those are companies that maybe we wouldn't have found otherwise. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and I hope that, you know, more VCs open themselves up to maybe non-traditional ways of, of finding their investments. Um, I mean, if you are... If you're limiting your uh, your scope to to introductions and you know who knows who, then it's really only encouraging the the system to to behave the way it has. We yeah. need to yeah look at at more uh, innovative ways of of finding the founders in the first place and and putting money in the right places. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If we take a step sort of further into people's careers and you know, academia, how do we attract more people from an earlier stage and age to say, actually, I want to get involved in climate science or in clean technology or in some aspect of impact, but you know, I'm, I'm an accountant or I'm a salesperson or, I, or, I'm a, or, I'm a, or I'm a scientist or you know, whatever that happens to be, how can we channel the best talent into roles that create an impact? How can we make it a attractive and welcoming for people um because i think there's still potentially an issue there in terms of seeing a pathway and be seeing not just a pathway but also having one that's receptive and welcoming and, and encouraging i think it's a really interesting time right now for climate tech in general because um i mean there's so much space for for innovation i mean climate touches everything we do so, you know, like you said, whether you're a, an accountant or or a teacher or a lawyer, like there is, there's overlap um, between, you know, your sort of your your skill set and what is needed in, in the climate world. Yep. And I think the first challenge is really to, you know, kind of take a step back and do that sort of skills inventory mm-hmm. um, on one side. And then on the other side to look, you know, where do my skills match with with the needs? Because you, you don't have to be a climate scientist right. to work in, in climate tech. I mean, we we need uh, developers and, you know, um, people with those practical skills to to enable the sector really to move forward. Um, and I think. I mean, you see a lot of these uh, like sort of climate tech schools, like how how to you can very quickly get sort of an overview of, yeah. of the issues at hand to see, you know, where where are the, the gaps and, and where you might fit in. But I mean, that that first step is really to do yeah the almost a Venn diagram of, of your, your skill set and, and where the, the gaps live. Yeah, I think sometimes there's a little bit, I and mean, then we encourage it obviously in terms of us as a group to try and get the best talents from whatever sector working into to, to yeah. our sector. We, want, we, we need as much of, uh, of that as possible. And I think there's sometimes this little bit of, again, a lack of knowledge can be, can be sort of. Uh, I have some people, you know, approach us saying, "Well, I, I can't approach you. I've been a, you know, a lawyer, or I've been a, you know, doing something for a number of years. I haven't got any clean tech experience." And 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 unfortunately, uh, a lot of companies in the sector are reluctant to take talent from from outside. And to some extent, you can extend you understand that because things move so quickly we haven't got time this week to train everybody from scratch but um there has to be i think within the community more acceptance of let's bring this talent in you know from whether they worked in oil and gas or telecoms or automotive wherever they happen to have worked if they if, if, if they have a talent then let's bring them on side and i think sometimes there's a uh from from i see at least sometimes a reluctance inside to allow that talent in not not from any uh negative reason other than just a Oh, things are moving too fast and we haven't got time kind of perspective. Interesting. I think that, I mean, maybe companies are are doing themselves almost a, a disservice in, in that respect, because if you have someone who comes from like an oil and gas background and wants to get into climate tech because they, you know, they, they've seen the light and they, you know, want to contribute to a better future. I mean, that's, you know, that's... Uh, insider perspective i yeah, mean yeah. that's like a, a look into the the mind of the enemy almost i mean that's that would be so valuable to to have i would think uh but i mean, i think that i mean t- 
10 years from now, I mean, I think most companies are, if they're not already, are going to be working with climate yeah. in, in some way. I mean, it's it's going to embed itself into, you know, every system on the planet, every company on the planet. Um, but yeah, I can I can see how how there might be that that hesitancy. But but we need diverse perspectives Absolutely. and different ways of approaching problems in order to solve the issues at hand. No, it's important. We, I won't mention again the client, but they've come a long way, but when we're first speaking to them, and they approached us and said that actually, you know, we're essentially, not only we're a bunch of white guys, but we're a bunch of white guys that went to the same university. <laughs> so there was that lack of diversity on any number of measures, and, and they've done very well to, to uh, on all levels to do that. But I think that's a, a, a key thing is to to understand that, you know, the future of all employment really can't you can't dis, you can't separate that from the climate issues because as you say that interweaves with everything that's going to be happening in the in the in the future. Um, storytelling is something we, we touched on briefly, sort of trying to tie together some of the themes that we've talked about in terms of how we can better educate and make people aware of all the things we've talked about. Uh, are, are there particular places that you? You mentioned I was taking some qualifications and throwing yourself into an internship earlier in your career to to learn that side, of the softer skills or communication skills, however you want to frame that, to to utilize that. Are there again places where listeners can uh, go to to uh, absorb some of those skills so that they can better articulate whether it's their their, their fund or better articulate their startup or even better, better articulate themselves in terms of their career journey? What are perhaps some of the key areas where you learned or where you went to? improve that side of your skill set um acumen academy acumen um being a, a social impact found a funding organization um has this amazing course called storytelling for change and it's it really it's largely based on you know how to develop your your personal experience and you know what drives you as as be it a an entrepreneur or um or a a, a venture capitalist but how to to take that experience and craft it into a story um and i think it's it was a really good opportunity for me to to think about you know what what drove me to to climb it in yeah. the first place you know why am i in this position you know what what uh what uh, inspired me from the very beginning, because I, I think a lot of us don't necessarily um, think about that that mm -hmm. too often. But that's a really good first step into the the world of storytelling is starting from, you know, your own personal experience right. and and crafting that into into something um, inspirational. And, and, and it also helps to to sort of establish your your authority and, mm -hmm. you know, why you, you are where you are. I mean, for me, um, it brought me all the way back to when I was in high school and there was this horrible snowstorm and they, they sent all the children home early from school. And at that point, I, I made it home. I was, I was in my teens, but my younger siblings got trapped on their bus in the middle of the city and they had to spend the night in, in a hospital that they just happened to be nearby. Mm -hmm. And I remember so clearly getting home, you know, my father, he's he's glued to the television. He's trying to figure out where where his children are. Mm -hmm. And I grew up in a place where this was common. Like it just it snows every year. So what 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 was different this time? Like, you know, why yep. did the snow catch us off guard? Um, and I think that was the first time that I really started having this interest in you know how does the weather and climate affect the way we live our lives right but i hadn't really made that connection until i started thinking about it for okay. this the storytelling course yeah yeah um uh, but i think that that starting to think about yeah where where your um your drive and your inspiration comes from and crafting a, a story around that is a really good first step into the the world of storytelling right Again, a little bit of self-analysis. I'll, I'll, I'll make sure we post uh, again a, a link to to that organisation on the on the episode page. It's been great to talk to. You. We could talk talk forever. I think in closing, one thing that's interesting is that uh, uh, you, you've obviously been in and around climate science and, and climate change now for for many years. You, you've seen many technologies and continue to do so. Are you more or less optimistic we can make the changes we need to make now than when you started your journey? 
I swing back and forth, to be honest. <laughs> um, when I was reading... So I had early access to the, the IPCC synthesis report. I, I was one of the the reviewers of the text, and I remember just feeling so uh, low and hopeless. Right. And like, what am I doing? Is anybody listening? And I mean, I, I've kind of had those swings throughout my my career as as a climate scientist. Um, and it was the same thing when I, I read the published report again. But then about a week later there was this amazing event called Sweden Innovation Days. It's It was an online event and it's all about, you know, um, innovation and entrepreneurship in, in Sweden and, you know, where where are the startups and, and, and what are they working on? And that event just inspired so much right. hope for me. And it came at, you know, a really crucial time where I needed to see, you know, people are working on this. Mm -hmm. Like there, there is a drive to address these problems and, and, you know, the talent exists and the, the will exists. We just, we need to, to scale it. We need to, to enable and power. So right now I'm, I'm on the hopeful side. <laughs> Good. <laughs> and I, I want to believe that we can make this happen. Yeah. Yeah, no, thanks for sharing that. And it is an important thing. I think we all have swing to that to some extent. But I think the thing that's really important from what you said there from my experience and from those I speak to is that community. It's important not to isolate yourself in a bubble, but equally sometimes it's nice to get into that bubble and, and be invigorated and energized and know that there are, as you say, so many talented people, so much good money, so much good intent making a difference that it keeps you optimistic and keeps you going because otherwise it can get to a, a fairly dark place as you just alluded to but uh, thank you for sharing your time Lindsay and your experiences and obviously we'll point people on the episode page to the, to the links that you've mentioned obviously to your uh, to yourself and to uh, pale blue dot but it's been great to have the conversation and thanks for sharing your thoughts thank you for having me david it's i really enjoyed our conversation mm -hmm.